Hello, Barcelona. Thanks for coming out to join me this morning. My name's Lorna. I'm a developer advocate at Nexmo. Helpfully, we're in the middle of rebrand, so next time you meet me, I'll say, hi, I'm Lorna. I'm a developer advocate at Vonage. Uh, <laughs> we've been bought. It's a good thing, but it means we're rebranding. Uh, developer advocate means I help developers to get things done, mostly using Nexmo pro products, but huh, kind of a fan of web dev in general. Um, and I also help Nexmo understand some developer type stuff. So it's great to be here with you um, and to kind of hear the hallway chat and all the, all, the, uh, all the other topics that are covered at this event. I'm really excited that I was allowed to bring the webhooks topic to you today. It's something that is incredibly simple. <laughs> I, could, I could nearly end my talk after the next slide. But at the same time, it's something that is fundamental to the way that we build modern applications. Um, and I have some general advice for you from my own experience. So what is my click is not working. This is fantastic. What is a webhook? <laughs> a webhook is an HTTP post request. It is an incoming Post, we know how to do this. Like PHP was invented to solve the web problem, it was originally designed to accept data from forms. We are incredibly well placed as a community, as a tech stack, to work with webhooks. In this talk, we will skate slightly over the uh, post aspect as some of Nexmo's webhooks come in as get by default. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Oh, that's fantastic. It's backwards. OK. Awesome. So why did I choose webhooks? I think they're key. If you're building an application today, you are either integrating with third-party APIs or you're integrating with other components that are not third-party, that are inside your application, but they interact over HTTP. Webhooks are event-driven HTTP. Instead of um, requesting data, data arrives unbidden in response to an event. This allows us to wire systems together and have them react to one another. You may also hear this called uh, asynchronous APIs, callbacks. There's a bunch of things. So the plan today is to talk a bit about webhooks, show you one example, get the idea of the moving parts, show you a more advanced example of how I would really do this as an engineer, um, and try and just give you a sense of what this is, what to expect, how to handle it. The best thing about webhooks is you're already familiar with them. Um, when something, I edited a Python repo, let's skate over that. <laughs> um, when you get these prompts in Slack, something happened on GitHub, Slack is telling you, that's a webhook. GitHub pushes the data to Slack and Slack renders it for you here. When you open a pull request and the build fails, <clears throat> it was me that broke this build. So I would never put anybody else's failure on a screenshot on a screen this size. Uh, I don't remember what I did wrong. I pushed some code, and I broke the build. Um, the way this works is GitHub pushes the event to Travis in this case. Travis puts it on a queue, <laughs> and we all go and wait, put the kettle on. <laughs> Sometime later, when that job completes, then Travis webhooks back to GitHub to say, oh, hey, that thing you sent me, this is what happened. So that's why sometimes when GitHub is having some issues, your Travis builds all look like they failed. They, and if you, but if you look on Travis, they didn't. And it's because the webhook's not arriving. So this is how we wire together systems that need to cooperate. There's a bunch of use cases. Um, Webhooks are great to notify of events. GitHub push is an obvious one, and it's one that perhaps you've integrated 
if not in your own applications, then in your own software development lifecycle tooling. Um, it's really common also to get webhooks in the event of an order, a payment. You're going to see incoming message because I work at Nexmo and do, we do communication APIs. So it's an obvious example and one that I'm really familiar with. But it's the same, you could use basically the same code for all of these different use cases. The data is delivered as soon as it becomes available. And we can also use webhooks to broadcast to lots and lots of receivers if we need to. Let's go back a step and think about how APIs work so we can compare them with the webhooks. When you call an API, the client asks the server for some data, and the server says, here is some data. Unless there isn't any, in which case you get no. <laughs> You're polling, there's nothing there. Compare that, then, with how the webhooks work, right? In, we do it the other way around. The server starts the conversation, sends the data down to the client, and says, here is your data. The client responds and says, thank you, and sends a smiley. In HTTP, we would spell the smiley as 200, OK. But you can always imagine a smiley when you see that. I'm telling you a joke about a smiley, but actually, this response is really important. When you receive webhook data, you must acknowledge it. And usually, <clears throat> there'll be a time window, quite a short one, within which you must send a success response. Otherwise, whatever is sending you the webhook may assume that's failed, might start doing retries to you, things get a bit more complicated. So we need to be, although we're not sending anything important, we need to be a bit conscious of this acknowledgement step. It's a key thing. Like most good ideas in software, that is great in isolation. I've gone back because my clicker's the wrong way around. OK, good. Uh, that is great in isolation. But what happens when you scale it up, when you consider how this is going to work over time? Well, APIs look something like this. Can I have some data? No, there isn't any. Can I have some data? No, there isn't any. You get the idea. There is some gets transferred somewhere in one of these slides. For the webhooks, here's some data. Thanks. You can instantly see how much less chatter happens when we're using the webhooks approach. It's no coincidence that the real leaders in this space are GitHub. Think about how many repositories you have on your GitHub account. For me, it's, it's less than 200. On the orgs that I look after at work, it's more than that, maybe 300 in total. Once upon a time, a long time ago, I'd have been running a CI, my own CI server, and I'd have been pinging GitHub every minute for every repository to ask if there are any changes yet. Most of the time, like I am almost never committing to almost any of my repositories. Right, right now, I'm not making many GitHub commits. So first of all, that's a lot of network traffic. And second of all, we used to wait up to a minute for the build to start. <laughs> my mind is slightly blown. So GitHub had to think about better ways to do it. So they moved away from the polling model and started pushing us data when there was some, because there would be so much empty uh, stuff. OK. Here is a fluffy animal. He is here to remind me to pause and not overwhelm you <laughs> by rushing forward into yet more stuff. You'll see a few of these as the talk gets a bit more chaotic. Awesome. So we've talked about polling APIs. We've talked about webhooks. There's one other major difference, and that is that this is still backwards. That is that you need to know where you are sending your webhook to, right? Your code calls a remote API. 
it's got a URL, you can call that from your dev platform, your test platform, your production platform, like whatever. When you do this with webhooks, you have to pre-arrange the server. The server has to know where the client is in order to be able to start the conversation. And it has to be available on a public URL, right? So if PayPal or Stripe is going to send you a notification of a payment, your code has to be reachable to the outside world, and that server has to know which URL you would like that data to be sent to. So we need to set up some stuff beforehand in a way that doesn't happen so much with APIs. We might also exchange some security stuff at this stage, and I'm going to talk more about message signatures shortly. So, I'm going to talk about receiving webhooks. First of all, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a tool that you need to know about in order to develop code that receives webhooks. That tool is called ngrok. Ngrok is a secure tunnel to your development platform. So instead of making a change to your code and pushing it up to the cloud or some other public server, ngrok allows you to have external access to code running locally. You run the command, it gives you a URL, whichever port you nominated in the command is now available on that URL to the world. So this is really useful. It allows you to use your phone to see how the website you're working on looks. It allows you to, I'm a remote worker, <laughs> it's hard to get people to look over my shoulder at work. So it allows me to send the link to someone who understands front end <laughs> so I can get some help with whatever I broke. Um, you can send a print link to someone as a preview if you need to, like, hey, it looks like this, what do you think? It allows you to receive web hooks into the code that's running on your local development server. That's pretty cool. It's not the coolest part. Ngrok comes with a local dashboard. So you get like a web interface running on your local machine that shows you all of the requests and all of the responses that are going on over the Ngrok tunnel. This is fantastic. Not every organization documents their webhooks as well as Nexmo does, <laughs> so there can be some surprises. Uh, and if you can replicate that into ngrok, then you can see exactly what arrived. You can also see exactly how your code responded. So you c that's very good for just debugging or working on something for the very first time. Very handy. Still not the coolest thing, though. The coolest thing is the replay button. <laughs> So all of those requests and responses, you can see the request come in. If your code does the wrong thing, edit your code, press the replay button. You don't need to go and reproduce that event that triggered that webhook. You can just press the replay button. OK, if you're integrated with GitHub, they have the best webhook support on the planet, and you can go and replay from their web interface. But not everyone has quite that level. So ngrok, you run it on your machine. It tunnels out to um, the ngrok servers, and it gives you an ngrok URL. It's different every time. You use that URL to configure the server that sends the webhook. It hits ngrok servers, and ngrok comes back in over the tunnel it made to hit your local dev tool. You will need this when you work on webhooks on your local platform. So we're going to look at an example. This example is an incoming SMS. Um, because I work for a communications API provider. So I work with this stuff all the time. <laughs> it's my favorite example. So now it has to be your favorite example, at least for the next 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> so with Nexmo, you can buy a number. And when an SMS is sent to that number, you will get an incoming webhook to your application. So let's have a look at that in action. Wow. Cool. So let me just see if any of my shortcuts work. They don't, so that's fine. First thing I need to do is search for a suitable number. Uh, this takes a country code, so we're looking for a Spanish number with SMS capabilities. Yeah. 
I've got some choices. This is cool. I have no idea if these are mobile numbers, geographical numbers. Don't know how Spanish dialing codes work. But look, it's a 3-4 dialing code. Great. So I'm going to pick one of these numbers. I'm going to pick that one, because I like the repeated digits. And I'm going to buy it. So again, this is just the Nexmo CLI tool. Just copy and paste the number I want and confirm it. Cool. Now I own that number. I am going to need some code to receive the webhook that happens when a text is sent to that number. So I am going to show you some code. The first thing that you might notice about this code is that it ends in .php. So once upon a time, we wrote PHP in files. And all we did was request literally the file name, and PHP would execute everything in the file. Um, I, th I think that's uncommon now with frameworks and things, but I got no baggage here. Um, if you're more of a framework person, probably all this stuff is wrapped up for you, usually. Um, but let's start with the basics. Print R will show you a formatted uh, rendering of the array. Did you know it took a second argument that will return it instead of output it? Ha, you do now. A dollar underscore request is a super global, is available in every context. Dollar underscore get, dollar underscore post put together makes dollar underscore request because some of Nextmo's webhooks are get, which you'll see in my examples. That's the default. If you are using Nextmo or you start to use Nextmo after this, um, configure it to post. I would like I demonstrate with the standard settings so I can do support, but I wouldn't necessarily deploy like this. Anyway, we're just going to error log that nicely formatted rendering of the variable. And I'm going to echo OK, partly so I know my script has run. I can differentiate between this and an empty string. PHP, by default, will return the 200 status that I need here. So I don't need to set any headers or anything. OK, so I've got some code. It's just going to output what happened. And I'm going to run the local PHP web server. I apologize for my typing skills. Um, <laughs> I'm going to run my local PHP web server here. And we can test this um, if I just open my browser tab and make a request to there. The file is called hook.php. And in true PHP tradition, I'm going to send some fruit as my example code. All right, awesome. That worked. We've got an OK. So I think we're pretty good to go. Next, we need to, oh, and you can see the data there in my web output. Next, we need to make that code available publicly. So this is where ngrok comes in. I'm going to run the ngrok command. I want it to pass HTTP data, and it's, my local port is 8080. You've just seen me spin up the local web server. So I start ngrok, and it looks something like this. Um, there are some really key things here. The main one is the HTTPS URL. So I'm going to copy and paste that. The I has dropped off in my demo, which confuses me in a few minutes, you'll see. <laughs> There's also the local web interface URL there on port 4040, which is great. So I can use my ngrok URL here. This is me going, where's the IO gone? Just put the O in. OK, good. <laughs> and we'll change the fruit as well, just so we can clearly differentiate between these requests. That looks good. Uh, there it is in my web logs. You can see the browser is still requesting fav icons because it's a crazy optimist. And then we can have a look at the ngrok console. So here's the request that I sent to hook.php. You can see the data there if I turn up the font size. Perfect. So we sent some fruit pair. Wonderful. Now I need to link that code to my phone number and say to Nexmo, when a text, when an SMS arrives at this number, please send the data to this URL. So pasting the number, pasting the URL. Happily, the video recording didn't get the swearing that went with this. OK, good. <laughs> so we just link like this. And you can rerun this command whenever you need to. So if you are using the free ngrok account, when you start ngrok, you'll get a new scrambly URL every time. So you'll probably find that you run this command quite a lot. I have a paid account, so I, have a URL, I, have, I can use the same URL all the time and not update all my webhooks all the time. I think it saves me plenty to pay for itself. 
All right, so we've got this all set up. I'm going to send a text from my phone, and there it is. So you can see the data come in, and then here it is. We can inspect every aspect of it. This is the human readable version. You can also get just the raw request, and you can see all of the fields that came in there. And yep, I can just replay it. It's one of my favorite features of um, NGROC. So, the question you should be asking now is this one. Oh, like, hey, I made code that accepts incoming data as a, as a post request and does stuff with it. Like, yay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we need to think a little bit about security. We're web developers. This is the easiest community in the world to talk to about this. Like, we know how the web works. You need to think about what you already know about HTTP and really bring that with you. Think about what the attack vectors are, right? We don't have CSRF tokens in this context because it's a lot like a form post, but it's coming from a server. We haven't just sent them a form to fill in. So that's not there. Please use SSL. There are no, like, let's encrypt is a thing. The future is here. There are no excuses for not using SSL. If you think you have a good excuse, I'd love to hear it. Um, with webhooks, I would always expect there to be some sort of security token hashing signature type arrangement. Um, Nexmo uses a shared secret that you'll see in a minute. But basically, everything you know about HTTP is everything you need to know to do this. With the shared secrets, the way this works is when you configure your um, endpoint, you can sign into your customer dashboard and get the shared secret. So that in this picture is the green key. The server knows the shared secret. I know the shared secret, and I've taught it to my code, but I haven't committed it to source control. OK. We have the, just the incoming data, so the stuff that you just saw coming in uh, with the webhook. We have a hashing algorithm. This is publicly known. If you want to do this with Nexmo, there are some extremely long-winded and kind of tedious instructions, or you can use one of our client SDKs. I had a nightmare getting this working in all of our client SDKs. Please use the client SDKs. I promise it will save you time. So the hashing algorithm, the purple wand, that is a publicly known thing. The data came into Nexmo. That gets transmitted to us. The shared secret never gets transmitted. On the server, Nexmo uses it to generate a signature. The signature is transmitted to us. The data is transmitted to us. OK, over on our application, we take that incoming data and that shared secret. We use the known hashing algorithm. We get a signature, and we compare that signature with what the server sent us. If they don't match, somebody fiddled with your data, please throw it away immediately. OK? So that's what's going on with the shared secret. We never transmit the secret. It's something that you know on both sides. You receive the data and the signature. You regenerate the signature on your side. Check it matches. If it doesn't, something happened. There's also some timestamp information in the data fields, so you can discard anything that is too old, so you can avoid timing attacks. And if that timestamp changes, the signature will fail. So you can't change anything without causing the signature to no longer work. Um, and I think this is quite a nice way of solving that kind of very stateless nature of incoming webhook data. Um, so Nextmo does it this way. The PHP library can do it for you. All you need to do is create a signature object, choose your hashing algorithm and your shared secret uh, beforehand, supply them here, then call check on the signature. Please tell me why you wouldn't do this, right? <laughs> please, please, please. If you are working with webhooks um, and this is offered, make sure you are checking the signatures on every request. It's super, super important. Otherwise, you are indeed running open endpoints on the internet. <sighs> 
Awesome. So, <clears throat> oh. um, you've learned about webhooks, how they're different from APIs. I've shown you a very exciting demo that received an SMS, so now you can all immediately integrate messaging into your applications. Woo! The trouble with being a developer advocate rather than the software engineer that I used to be is at this point that's good enough. I've shown you how the parts move. I can go to the pub now. I want to show you how I would really implement this as an engineer, because I've done it wrong a few times, <laughs> uh, and I've also done it improbably right. Um, and I have some tips to share. So I want to talk about not just the one webhook at a time, like how do you set it up, how do you receive it, how does it look, but also how do you deploy this into your applications. It's just an HTTP request. Please don't invent encoding, decoding, authentication, or anything else that we've already got, right? There's nothing special about this. You're web devs. You're fine. I, I could make the argument either way on this, but I have had really good success with just storing the data that arrived. Remember that when you receive a webhook, you need to acknowledge it reasonably quickly. So don't mess about what account ID is in this webhook? Does it exist? Is it valid? Is, does they have a current subscription? Does this sensor exist? You're like, uh, whoa. Just store what you got. Acknowledge the rub. Be sure that you've stored it. Wait for the database command to return. Whatever. Q, Q command. Acknowledge it. Um, and just log the whole thing that came in. Rasmus talked a bit yesterday about pushing the work off the web servers to somewhere else. This is that. You do not want to hold incoming web, webhook connections open while you mess about, right? Accept, store, acknowledge, done. Try not to do much more than that here unless you have really major security concerns or you think you're a really big target, in which case you are forgiven. There are definitely use cases for being defensive enough to not store stuff. I like to store everything that's coming in so that I can then work with it and maybe report on what it, bad stuff is coming in as well. I really like to use a queue here. Webhooks are just as bursty as the rest of the internet, right? <laughs> Especially something like this, which is driven by payments or messages or just like humans doing a thing, right? Uh, inevitably, that phone number will be on a TV campaign or something. Uh, people do still watch real-time television, <laughs> and they do send text messages. Um, don't lose your web tier to this. So most of the time, your webhook endpoints will be somewhere on your existing web infrastructure. Um, so we do, what we don't want to do is affect the performance of what you already made. So I really like to use queues here. Um, they do a great job of pushing the work somewhere else. I have an example for you. This example uses Beanstalk D and Slim PHP. It's Slim 3 for anyone who cares. I am not particularly preaching Beanstalk D. It's a personal favorite, for sure. It's very lightweight. It's very simple. It's open source. It's easy to run on dev and to administer on live. I'm a huge fan. Redis is a great alternative, especially if you already have it in your stack. Its queue is absolutely adequate. Talk to me separately about persistence and Redis. If you're in the Laravel space, Laravel Horizon is Redis, but you can pay for it, and it's got a nice web front end, which is kind of Laravel. Um, if you're in the AWS space, SQS will do what you need here. Don't feel you need to spin up anything new. Just bolt onto the ser other services. Um, I've also used RabbitMQ here. It's more powerful, a little bit, a little bit heavier, um, more complex, way more features. So if you need to have lots of different queues and ha have a good track on retrying failed jobs and stuff like that, Rabbit's a great choice. Beanstalk does have named tubes, does understand priorities, so it's going to cover most of your use cases. All right, so here's some code. This is the, setting, the config, just setting up the queue object in Slim PHP. So all we're doing is adding a queue to the container. The PHP library for Beanstalk is, of course, called Feenstalk, because why not? 
Um, and I'm running it locally, so it's just a host and a port. There's a bunch of other security stuff supported by Feenstalk. Uh, Oh, look, I've left a pro tip for you in my slides. If you're not already using Vance's uh, php.env library, give that a shot. I really like it for setting environment variables on development platforms. Um, so just shout out for that, one of my favorite things. And here's the root. Regardless of what framework you usually write, hopefully you can work your way through this. We have a, we're registering a get root called slash webhooks slash inbound SMS. I am fetching the incoming parameters. On line 16, I am assembling an array of data. It contains event message. I might have other events sometime in this app. I like to start with this. Uh, the text, just the body of the SMS that came in. Some information about when I received it. So you've probably already noticed that in the data, We've got some timestamps, and that's both the timestamp of the message and the timestamp that goes with the signature. <laughs> so, of course, we need more timestamp. <laughs> SMS here in Europe is pretty instant. Uh, Nexmo is an extremely global company. We can deliver messages to every country in the world except one. Um, but the infrastructure quality and speed somewhat varies in different countries, so SMSs can totally arrive three hours later. So it's helpful for me to know when I received it as opposed to when it was elsewhere in the ether. Have a look at line 19. I'm setting a payload um, element with just the whole parameters, everything that arrived. That makes my code fit on the slide, right? Because <laughs> I'm going to need most of those fields. But also, if I get any unexpected fields, I probably want to know that. I find it very useful to always have the entirety of what arrived in the, in the webhook. So top tip, log all of it, um, because it is, you just don't know when that can be useful. And sometimes it can be when things have gone wrong. Um, sometimes you can get a nice surprise that your provider suddenly added you a new field. Um, but you won't see it if you're only pulling out a few uh, fields. There's an error log call, so you'll see that. And then I'm putting the message on the queue. Most of the queues just accept a string, so uh, Beanstalk is the same. So you just JSON encode a load of things and stick them on the queue. You are good. What I like about this is that you also have the option, it's just JSON encoded, right? To then pass that in something else. So if you have a performance issue or exactly the library that you need, exists in a different tech stack. The queues can be a nice place to kind of do the join between the tech stacks. It's a very generic interface uh, to allow you to do those things together. So I quite like it. All right, so let's have a look at this one in action. Perfect. So Ngrok is still running. If anyone can remember that demo that was 10 minutes ago before I talked about a bunch of queues. Um, <laughs> Ngrok is still running on port 8080. And now I'm starting the PHP web server in the project whose code you have just seen. So it's a, it's a basic slim project. We've configured a queue, and we've set that one route to receive the incoming webhook. The code's all on GitHub. If I've worked Twitter correctly, my account will tweet you a link to it. Later, maybe. Cool. So <clears throat> the webhook is running. I need to update what happens when I text the number, because the root is different in this application. So we'll just make this match our root that you saw in the example. Number updated. Cool. So send you a text. Lorna typing text. There we go. Sent you a text. You can see it in the error log. Um, and, and in my web logs. We can inspect it here in Ngrok, so you can see all the um, fields come in. Right, this is um, just a local tool. It's not part of Beanstalk. It's called Beanstalk Console. It's also open source, actually written in PHP, which is cool. All the best things are written in PHP. So I can have a look at my local uh, Beanstalk server. This is everything that's in the SMS 
tube that I added the jobs to earlier. Uh, you can see I've got one job ready. And if we zoom in on that and scroll down a bit, then you can see all the data. This is the data that I built in that web route that you've seen the code for. The payload shows everything that arrives from Nexmo. We've talked a bit about the signature. Um, there's a nonce in there as well, just like a bunch of data. Awesome. So we have things in the queue, which is nice. Um, the data is in a queue. Wow. Now what? We need to write a separate piece of code that's going to consume that data. So we handled the webhooks. We put them in a queue. Now we're going to write some code to, to consume that. It's called a worker. Now, hello, PHP developers. If you write workers in PHP, somebody will tell you you are doing it wrong. I dispute that. PHP is a perfectly good language for workers. There are some things that we do in our PHP applications that <laughs> are the result of our very isolated processes, right? The web request starts, we get a brand new clean process, we do whatever we like, and when we've finished, it gets garbage collected. So we're very, very isolated in the way that we usually write PHP. We don't worry too much about memory management, we don't worry too much about deallocating things, okay? When you write workers, your process is going to start, it's going to pick up a job, it's going to run that job. Then it's going to pick up another one into the same execution thread. So you need to be extremely paranoid about initializing everything and, re and reinitializing everything, closing all the resource handles that you open. If you have a low traffic site, beware that your PHP might run for several hours without getting any incoming data, in which case your database connection will probably get bored and wander off. Uh, so you need to be quite defensive in the way that you do this. Is the database there? OK, connect to it if it isn't, and then write to it, and then maybe close the handle. Worker scripts run kind of alone. <laughs> they, they never output errors <laughs> to web consoles. They're just by themselves on a separate server. Hopefully, you have it integrated with your excellent logging infrastructure. Um, but they need to be quite independent. They need to be defensive, and they need to know what to do if they get bad data. Most of the time, bad incoming data to your webhooks is the result of somebody doing something wrong. It is usually not actually malicious, <laughs> but it can still take your whole site down. <laughs> so just be a little bit uh, hesitant about accepting that data and what you can do with it. It's good to run lots and lots of worker scripts. So you write one PHP script, run it lots of times, maybe from the console. Um, usually have something looking after those processes, like supervisor D or system D, whatever you like. When you are processing content off queues, things get processed very independently from one another. Things will get processed out of order, so you cannot rely on the order things happened in. If order matters, then these tasks are not independent. You cannot distribute the work in this way. Um, also, if something goes wrong between the job being completed and the job being acknowledged, sometimes things can get processed twice. So your code just needs to be, when you move up to this sort of distributed systems approach, you need to be able to handle things getting processed twice. Um, yeah, so that's workers. Here's a very, 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 very simple, because it has to be to fit on the slide, <laughs> set of code. I'm going to watch the queue, and then I'm just going to run a while loop that says, is there a job? I'd like to reserve it. Now I'd like to process it, and now I'd like to delete it. If I reserve the job, something goes wrong, and my process exits, Beanstalk, after a while, will be like, huh, that didn't get processed, and it'll let something else reserve it. So it's a configurable timeout on the reserve. The process looks like this. Um, it's here in, in this secure worker class, and all we're going to do is validate that message signature 
I am going to try not to rant about message signatures again. Seriously, check your message signatures. OK. And then it's going to write to the file. The message signature stuff is here, but it's exactly what you've seen. So let's see that in action. Back to my video. OK, perfect. For this, I'm going to start the worker script, and it will process all the messages. Um, it's, it's super quick once you start the workers. Uh, if we go back to the queue, you can see there's nothing in the queue now. It's very strategic that when I show you this, the workers were not running. On a dev platform, especially a powerful one like this, I'm running a relatively new X1, um, putting things in a queue and then processing them with a worker genuinely seems like a synchronous operation. It's very, very quick. So if you have like, let's do the image processing on a queue, you can, by the time you've written the other form fields to the database, requested the image resize, and done the next page load to send back to the front end, the image resize is finished. So when you develop on applications that use queues, make sure that at least from time to time, you turn off your workers and have a look at what happens when your queue fills up or the workers are offline, maybe you got very popular, I had one situation where our application wasn't exactly live. It was more like soft live. So like it existed, had a couple of web servers and a database, and like we were previewing it to some investors. A well-known footballer, and I know you have football here in Spain as well, a well-known footballer tweeted the link. <laughs> we had rather a lot of unexpected traffic. Now, it was one of those sites where you can register and upload an avatar, and then it was all uh, like social image-based. There was a lot of image resizing going on. Um, our queues got full. Everybody was able to register, was able to comment, was able to interact. Uh, the priorities were set correctly on the queues. The website stayed up. I was on a flight, so I didn't get to panic about it, because I had no idea this was happening. Um, when I got the numbers through from our awesome web hosts the next day, it was like, yeah, I have no idea how that application stayed up. <laughs> but the queue, really, the queue really saved us. And it took a couple of hours to kind of work its way through the backlog, but it got there. Without the queue, that web front end would have been down in minutes. And we got a whole load of engagement and new people and lots of fun things happening because we were able to handle that load. I wasn't expecting to handle the load, but the queue really made a big difference, and I feel that way about the webhooks as well. <sighs> We're nearly there. Webhooks are awesome. I'm a huge fan. They're going to come up in all kinds of contexts. I've shown you one example today, which is just receiving an SMS, something I do all the time. Every day I felt confident to bring it as my example, but you'll see it when you get events coming in from other systems, whether that's messages or GitHub pushes, Slack notifications, payment notifications, order notifications, I'm seeing more and more of these things. Um, I'm actively working on improving the ecosystem for webhooks. I'm hoping that we'll get support into open API if anyone's using API description um, pretty soon. If you're interested in that, please talk to me because I'm actively working on that. Um, I think they're a big part of modern applications. I think if you are not already integrating with webhooks, it will be coming up for you fairly soon. And I hope that what I've given you today is a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of confidence, and hopefully <laughs> a few gotchas for you to avoid as well. Some things that I wish I'd known at the start. So hopefully that gets you off to a really good start. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, I have... Um, some um, resources for you. We've talked about how they fit into your applications. Um, so yeah, the, you can read my web services book from O'Reilly. Follow my blog, follow Nexmo, they're great. I mentioned Ngrok. You've seen an example using Slim Framework. There's a link for Beanstalk D as well. And if you want that code sample that you just saw a little bit of and then the video, the whole thing is on GitHub. So you can just grab that um, if you want to have a play locally. 
It's also easy to switch out for a different queuing system if you want to do that as well. And with that, I'll say thanks very much. So the talk was on time, but since we started a bit early, maybe we can do some Q&A. Um, so first of all, someone was really excited about how you pronounce Engrok because they thought it was NG Rock. I've always said Engrok, but... Um, <laughs> I have always said Engrok, but I'm not sure that's the official version. Yeah, okay, we, should sure. check, we should check that out. So then um, you, you mentioned that things like, okay, um, just reply a 200 really quickly and then process that, but what if you're in an application that is crashing, you don't have that pattern, and how can you debug or like reproduce things that already happen or like how some patterns to like uh, in legacy applications or places like that? Sorry guys, keep it low please. <clears throat> so things can get a bit exciting um, and one of the reasons that I recommend that you do that very lightweight, just store it on the web front end and move on is because once it's in the queue, you can, it gives you more of a chance to be like, oh, we can't process it, it's failing. That's fine, it'll go back on the queue. You can go again if you're using RabbitMQ um, or one of the more advanced queuing systems. You can route failing jobs into dead, le into dead letter queues and then come back and debug those later. So by doing very little on the front end, you increase your resilience and you increase your chances of being able to recover if something unexpected does happen. So someone's asking about instead of using tokens like asymmetrical keys, I guess that depends on the contract with you are integrating with, right? So I mean, there's not much. Yeah, dif different API providers will give you different um, security schemes. I've seen a bunch. I like the shared secret. I think it keeps everything nice and stateless. Um, and I want you to check your next mo signatures, especially. Um, but yeah, there are some others for sure. Yeah, so someone tried to do a SQL injection. Luckily, we're using Doctrine, so <laughs> nothing happened. Um, yeah, it's on there and it has some likes. So um, then um, people are asking about, like, let's say, so the, 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 the server receiving that webhook is on a private network. Yeah. So some patterns to, like, um, to uh, like receive the public request and then route that internally or, like, patterns yeah, you that you can't, could recommend. No, you can't receive from an extra, you can't receive a webhook on a private URL. So even if all you have is the code that I showed you, that first one that just grabs it and writes it, that has to be running public somewhere. There's no reason that you shouldn't do that, for example, in a serverless endpoint, and then write that to somewhere that you can kind of then integrate against your private network without actually opening web traffic into your private network. I love serverless for receiving web hooks. I just didn't, couldn't fit it into this version of the talk. Examples exist. Ping me if you need one. So I'm um, not sure if you're familiar with the tools, but people are asking, like, Engrok compared to local tunnel, Serveo. I'm not familiar with them, so... Uh. Yeah, there's a bunch of alternatives to Engrok. Uh, local tunnel I've heard of. I love Engrok. I have paid accounts, sorry. So it's all about practice, right, yeah. I guess? <laughs> and then, yeah, that's related to... Yeah, I think security. some of the IDEs also have built in, publish this, give me a temporary URL for this thing. So if you have that, feel free to use that too. I just love the web interface and the replay button and stuff, so... So you mentioned this pattern of uh, replying quickly, but then what happens if the data was tampered? How do you check validation there? Like, I guess it's all about adding layers of like... like uh, yeah, you're a little bit... With webhooks, you're a little bit at the mercy of the data that comes in on the webhook. Um, you can see that I added my own timestamp, and that helps me a little bit yeah. understand how I'm doing with the processing. And then um, someone's asking, yeah, I also thought that Beanstalk was a bit abandoned or like, is it still active or? Uh... Yeah, I, ha I know it hasn't had an update for a while, but it's not going anywhere. Um, I guess Redis would be another alternative. It just has a little bit less in it than, yeah. you know, Beanstalk's <laughs> persistent and easy and I love it and it was already installed, so. And then people are asking like, what happens if you don't act in a short time? Like, let's say your, your request goes for long. Right. This is a really good question. So when you receive the webhook and I said, oh, it's so important, you must acknowledge within a short amount of time, what if you don't? Um, it depends on your provider. Um, some of them will retry. So for the Nexmo SMS use case, yeah, we'll retry. So you'll get a retry one minute later and then I think three minutes later. So you'll get a few retries. That's hilarious if I've messed up a demo and then I try and do a live demo because I've still got the retries coming into the same, <laughs> coming into the same endpoint. Um, try to acknowledge quickly, and that's why I recommended doing as little processing as possible. But I think also wise to prepare yourself for the retries and be like, did I get this one? Um, most of them will come with a unique ID, you know, like GitHub push has the commit ID. 
Uh, Nextmo will send you a message ID. The payment, Stripe payments come with also with a uh, transaction ID. So you can just check if you have it already. So then they're asking, like you mentioned, this worker thing. Do you use supervisor or maybe alternative for like keeping? Them? I use supervisor. There are lots of alternatives. I am not in ops. So really, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> really whatever is already in your stack um, or that you or your ops team are already comfortable with, choose that one. Because if they know how to work it, then it's yeah. more likely to go right at 4 a.m. And then people are asking, like, okay, this um, answer quickly pattern, but what if like, it makes no sense at all, like bad format, unknown entity, like, things like that? Would you still do little processing in the request or not even that, like just fucking Maybe a little bit. So yeah. in my example, I was pulling the text field out. Um, just so that I could search on it later and then log it. If you haven't even got a text field, like maybe just log what you got and forget it. Like, yes. Yes, this, if it's something as quick as that, like do I have these two expected fields? If not, never mind. Um, it's probably also fine. Don't do lots of database lookups, though. So I think we're pretty much done with the online questions, but um, if there's any extra questions, we still have maybe one minute or so.